everybody. So bear with me while I get my clickers working. Okay. So while we're getting my clicker working, uh, last year my daughter was married, who was, and my daughter was the reason I first, can you guys hear me in the back there? Yep. My daughter was the reason that I actually first got connected to Savannah. Um, she, like many people I've got to meet, was a, is now a SCAD grad. Um, and that brought me here. Anyway, so last year she got married and most of my Australian family obviously couldn't make it to the wedding that was here. And so we had two weddings in two weeks. We had one up in New York and we had one in Australia. Now, if you have any spare cash and you want to get rid of it really quickly and you're trying to think, well, how would I get rid of my money really quickly? I recommend two weddings in two weeks in two continents <laughs> because you can get carpal tunnel syndrome signing checks when you do this. But anyway, that's not the story. The story is that when I went back, I saw my mum and she said to me, speak slowly. You have a heavy southern accent <laughs> and I can't understand a word you're saying. So I'm now officially misunderstood in several continents <laughs> by friends and family alike and by strangers. So you'll have to put up with my uh, kind of mixed up, mixed up accent. It's lovely to see you here today and thank you very much. Uh, and thank you particularly to the sponsors. These things never just happen. I mean, I know we all know that, but the amount of work and dedication that the sponsors do, the work that End Market does, the, one, the work that Healthy Savannah, that Garden Alliances, um, this stuff really matters. It's important to us uh, and it's important to our children and to their children. So I applaud the fact that you came out today to listen to this talk and I hope uh, I'm up to the task of giving you some information. So. We're going to talk, amongst other things, about ginger and turmeric, but generally we're going to talk about wellness. Now, every presenter always tells people to pay attention, but this is very important because there's going to be quizzes through most of this presentation <laughs> with prizes. All right, there's prizes involved. And for all you, or as my children have told me never to say in public, all you all here in the front, uh, this is like going to a comedy sketch where you suddenly realize you should never have sat in the front row <laughs> and that you start like sinking down into your chairs a little bit. That's going to happen to you today. All right, so that's what we're going to talk about. I hope that's what you expected to hear. Uh, let me point. Where do I point? Okay. Thank you. Okay, first, just in case there's any lawyers in the room, we always have to have a disclaimer. I'm going to say some things about wellness. I'm not a doctor. I didn't sleep in a Holiday Inn last night and I'm pretending to be a doctor. <laughs> None of that's true. I am actually a chemist, but we'll get to that in a slide or two. Um, I think I was well introduced. So, so Verdant Kitchen. It really was a discussion in 2012 between my business partner, Howard Morrison, and I, where we sat around and talked about getting old. Um, and the consequences to our bodies of getting old. Uh, and, and is there something that we actually should be doing about that? And this is why we're drinking whiskey, right? <laughs> so, uh, yes, and, and we said, not only can we do something, maybe we should do something. And not only should we do something, maybe we can make a business out of it. So I'm a great believer in sustainability. We hear that world a lot. But sustainability also means economic sustainability. We wanted to do good. We wanted to make some money while we were doing good so we could do more good. And that was part of it. We're not a not-for-profit, but we have a mission. And that mission is to try and bring healthy, delicious alternatives to people every day um, and make a difference in people's lives. And the thing that I'm most interested in 
is not just extending people's lives, but what I want is really high quality of life. I don't want us to be crippled with arthritis. I don't want us to be pushed aside by diabetes, by heart disease, by all of those things that cut the quality of our life short. And let me tell you, the things I'm gonna to talk to you about today and things that you can do every day starting today can make a huge difference in your quality of life. So that's, that's what we do. All right, now, first pop quiz. The one on the left here, the one on your right, right? What is this thing? What is this thing? Well, you get to blow this up. When I went to school, I remember coming out of my organic chemistry lecture and on the wall there was a version of this about as big as this screen. These are the chemical reactions that take place to allow us to have energy in our body. This is just a little piece of it. If you could zoom in here, every one of these is a chemical reaction. Every one of those reactions has to work, has to work every time. If any one of those things go wrong, we get sick. This is one little tiny piece of how our bodies work. The more you understand the complexities of our bodies, the more you are amazed when you wake up in the morning. The fact that we function at all is a miracle, a miracle. And the more you know, the more amazed you become I was just chatting with Gordon about this. You know, we were talking about going to that bodies exhibit. And you see the complexity, physical complexity. But however physically complex our bodies are, a hundred times they are more chemically complex. It's a miracle that we exist at all. But here's some bad news and some good news. Bad news. With so many parts to our body, with so many complex chemical reactions, the probability that something could go wrong is actually really high. I mean, just, you just got to look at this and realize uh, that extra whiskey that Howard and I had, I'm sure it screwed up something <laughs> in here, you know. That 15th time I got sunburnt as a 10-year-old in Australia on a beach with no ozone layer above me, I've already paid for that. Right? My father used to say, you carry your scars. You kind of accumulate the good and bad in your, in your life. So there's a lot that can go wrong. And um, some interesting books and things I'll throw your way that you might want to look at. Certainly look at a guy by the name of Dr. Michael Greger. He runs a, he runs a cool site uh, called Nutritional Facts org fact-based information about nutrition and writes a great book called how not to die and one of the interesting things about that book a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek title but the thing about that book is it talks about the leading causes of death now I've got bad news for all of you in here you are all gonna <laughs> die right all of us not today <laughs> not today we're all going to die but it turns out particularly those of us that live in the US, we die differently than almost everybody else in the world. We die of lifestyle diseases, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, right? Rheumatoid arthritis. These are diseases that almost nobody in the rest of the world gets to the degree that we get them. And I'm talking 10 times 10 times, prostate cancer. Every man, every man will have prostate cancer when they die. Question is, has it developed? But the seeds of it will be there. Most women have breast cancer. The question is, has it developed? But in most countries, most cultures, based on their lifestyle and their diet, many of these things don't develop into chronic disease. And why is that? We are all the same people. We are all the same people. It's lifestyle and diet and stress and environmental factors that cause these nascent problems often to become large problems. Good news is we can do something about that. 
So the good news, our bodies are designed to return to what I call a natural state of wellness. There are, as complex as our bodies are, there are hundreds of redundant pathways so that when things go wrong, they can go right. And we can get sick and we can get well. Right? We're not designed just to go through life without anything going wrong. We're actually designed to go through life with lots of things going wrong and then heal. We have all these processes in our body to heal. We just have to let our body do it, right? And not keep getting in its way. And when you look at a lot of other cultures around the world, and particularly if you look at the blue zones, I'm not sure whether anybody's heard of this term blue zones, but these are zones around the world where people live to very advanced years. Okinawa is one example. And when you look at these places, they all eat different food, but they all have a set of things that are common. They tend to live in family units. They tend to be generally loved. They tend to do physical exercise. They tend to eat a mainly vegetable-based diet. Right? These things are common and they live long and well for many, many years, right? So do they never get sick? No, they get sick. It's just that they recover and they don't have these lifestyle diseases. So I want you to think about this natural state of wellness it's a powerful idea that when you don't feel well, you think in the end, this is what I'm destined to be. It's not. What you're destined to be is well. Question is, how can you help your body get well? What choices can you make to allow your body to find these alternative ways? Does it mean suddenly you're going to become a, like an athlete? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying live a full active life. All right, ginger and turmeric, ancient spices, ancient spices, over 7,000 years of recorded history. 7,000 years of recorded history. Okay, now it's not fair. I got like smart gardeners down the front here, right? <laughs> so they, they're, already, they're, already, they're already looking at this. They're already editorializing. That's not the correct use of that. All right, here we go. Subtropical means, gardeners, subtropical means? Oh, come on, don't disappoint me. You've been up here and you got the, I'll take the check back if you can't answer these questions. <laughs> right, they said that to me. Answer the questions, I'll take the check back. Warm weather, warm weather, right? They grow in warm weather. Should have been with me on the farm yesterday. Yes, sir. So does turmeric. We put nearly 100 inches of water on these crops. There's about, what, 55 inches of rain in Savannah generally, so we nearly double that. Right, they love rain, they love sandy soil. They don't like being wet, but they do like lots of rain. They like lots of fertility in the soil. Right, lots of biodynamic goodness helps them a lot. Um, I think I've got a map coming up Native, normally most people believe these came out of the southern part of India. Okay, the southern part of India. That's where these were, where they probably developed several thousand years ago. Okay, rhizome. Rhizome means they propagate from roots. So you take like a, well, not exactly like a potato, but if I took this, and if it were about, you know, yay big, like from the store, and I put that in the ground at the right time of year and care for it at the right way, it would grow a new ginger plant. So they propagate from rhizomes. They are herbaceous perennials. So, um, that picture I had before, see this? This is turmeric growing. This is ginger growing out underneath the Spanish moss, which I love. There will be a frost. This will be dead to the ground like there is nothing there. I mean, it will die. And this, I was in the turmeric yesterday. It is seven feet tall at the moment. It will be dead to the ground as though nothing ever existed there as soon as it gets cold. It likes cold less than I do. It's very, <laughs> it's very Australian. 
Um, herbaceous, that is, dies to the ground. Perennial, comes back again. Rhizome propagated, herbaceous, perennial. We plant in these climates around February. We harvest in January. This takes longer than a baby and more trouble. <laughs> we don't, you dig it up. We dig it up. Like a tulip bulb, at the end of the year, we dig them all up. We use it in December, January, February. After the frost, we dig them up. We process them to make all the lovely products. And then we take the very best of it and we plant them again. And the cycle continues. Yes, ma'am. Ha. So when we go to harvest them, the leaves are dead, right? But last week, about this time of year, each year, I have people ring me, mostly out of California, who want to buy ginger leaves and turmeric, and particularly turmeric leaves. Wrapping things in turmeric leaves is delicious. You can bake things in turmeric leaves. Every part of these plants are edible, and all of them smell a little bit like ginger and turmeric. When you walk past those ginger fields, even with the slightest breeze, the whole place smells like fragrant ginger. Which is one of the great reasons why deer do not eat ginger and turmeric. And that is the only reason we still have a business. <laughs> All right. So, um, there's nearly 1,300 members of the Zingabraceae family, of which gingers and turmeric are part of. Many of them are ornamentals. You see them in the squares. You know, the beautiful uh, purple and yellow striped, that's ginger. That's an ornamental ginger. You'll often see it in the squares downtown. Um, they're part of the Heliconian family. So these are you know, beautiful birds of paradise, flowers. So long, a long history and a very large family of uh, products. Um, that's great, but why are we here? These are the most amazing collection of health positive chemicals in here, polyphenols. The colors, the fragrances, the flavors of these spices are between 50 and 100 different chemicals all packed into these spices. Most of them are extremely beneficial to our health. Extremely beneficial. So you'll see this idea of phytochemicals, often the brightly colored things that we see in carrots and apple skins and grapes. You'll hear this word phytochemical. Most phytochemicals are very good for you as antioxidants. We'll talk about that in a moment. Polyphenols, you'll hear that word a lot. These are naturally occurring chemicals that are very good at inflammation, at reducing the development of cancer, um, of helping our liver, uh, our lower gut. These are wonderful products. So when you see these words, polyphenols and phytochemicals, these are nature's pharmacy of what we have, right? So that's ginger and turmeric. This is a pretty picture of turmeric. Turmeric actually looks like a whole bunch of worms is what it looks like. It is not the most photogenic uh, of the wonderful ginger family. Um, and it is brilliant, brilliant orange. Okay. So, a little bit of history. A little bit of history. Let's start back here. 2000 BC. Kerala, India. Gorgeous place. Tropical, not just subtropical, but tropical. I have read in the Indian Vedas, this is their religious history. In the Vedas going back 2000 BC and beyond, there are mentions of ginger in these Vedas. So they were using it both as a food, as a medicine, and in religious symbolism 2000 BC, 3000 BC. I found this great picture here, the one on your right. This is an Assyrian warrior on a hieroglyph in Egypt drinking ginger beer after a battle with his family. I love that one. Um, this map here, see this guy? 
for the first prize. What is this a map of? Trade routes of who? Romans. This is Roman trading routes, um, trading ginger. We had a few correct answers. A ginger preserve with lemon. Oh, turmeric infused honey. And there is no medicinal benefit to these at all. These are savannah snaps. This is old school ginger snaps, but they will make you really happy. All right. Shakespeare, nine mentions of ginger. If you go look at Shakespeare's works, nine times in his works. He, now, why I say this is just to give you a sense of how pervasive these have been through history. So Shakespeare said, I had but one penny in the world, thou shalt have it to buy gingerbread. How highly prized was it? Next pop quiz. A little before Shakespeare's time, how many pounds of ginger would it take to buy one sheep? Now this, this is a question to amaze your children. <laughs> yes, ma'am. A half a pound. You, you are half correct. A pound. Oh, Lord. Don't, don't you hate it when someone gives half the answer and somebody else wins the prize? There you go. You get to split the prize. <laughs> okay, the, guy, the handsome guy in the middle, who's that? Marco Polo. The non-health promoting Savannah Snaps. Marco Polo helped spread the use of ginger right across from Asia and into Europe, 1300. Well documented. If you read, if you read the travels of Marco Polo, he talks about these products. Um, 1550, the Dutch East India Company fought a war over ginger. Ginger and pepper and turmeric. These were the spices of empire. It's one of the reasons Savannah exists, because of the movement of the English and the French and the Spanish searching for spice and places to grow spice. 1750, 1750, 52, the voyage of Van Eyck came to Savannah, published by Beehive Press. I have one of these books rare books. In it, what do we find in Trustee's Garden? Ginger, together with pineapples. Right? Why? Because they were trying to find ways to grow some of the most lucrative and important foods they had in history. Right? So the history of ginger has been the history of world empire. Now, why is that? Here's an interesting observation of everybody in this room. So I've had, I have not had to, I've had the opportunity to live in many places around the world and a number of them have not been very wealthy. And most places I go, people don't have any choice what they eat. Okay, you eat what you can eat. The US, we all get to choose, even the poorest among us. We get to have choices of what we eat but it's only been a relatively new phenomenon. Most of history, right up until about you know, the 1800, the vast majority of the population had real scarcity of the types of food they could eat. So if, if you have really scarce things, well, what do you choose? You choose things that you get two for one benefit. Nobody ever used to eat refined products. Why? Well, not only were they not available, because all you ever got was calories from them. But if I'm sitting there and I'm a Roman soldier up on Hadrian's wall and I'm cold and my knees ache, I want something that's delicious and good for me, right? And the history of the old foods, kimchi, sauerkraut, beer, beer, we like beer, beer's a good old food. 
ginger, pepper, turmeric, they are delicious products that have functional wellness. You get two for the price of one. Everything people used to eat, they tried to get two for the price of one. If they could get three, great. But nobody ever ate something just because it tasted good, not unless you were like the king, right? You only ate things if it was delicious and good for you. So two for one. The thing to think about these products is don't take them because they're medicine. Take them because they are delicious and they will make you happy. And in so doing, they will also help your body. Food is a joy. What I hate about modern culture of food and diets and cookbooks is we're made to feel bad about food, like we have to count calories. I say to hell with calories. Just eat real food. <laughs> that, now, I'm not saying like, you know exactly what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. So don't worry about that. If you eat nothing but wholesome food, here's the trick. Eat nothing that your grandmother's grandmother would not recognize as food. If she couldn't describe it, if she couldn't point to it, if she couldn't grow it, don't eat it. If you go into a grocery store, never leave the outside walls of the grocery store. If you can't touch that wall, you are in danger. <laughs> right? Because only bad things made by chemists like me lurk in the middle of the store. Be on the outsides. Eat real food. So, long history, right? Um, ginger is a food. Ginger and turmeric are foods. I know we're talking about wellness today, but let's start with the fact that they are food. They have had panel testing for 7,000 years. You cannot eat ginger and turmeric and hurt yourself, except be careful if you are on prescription medications, particularly blood thinners, ginger is a very potent blood thinner. Potent, right? So if you're on Coumadin or Warfarin or one of these things, talk to your doctor before you take these things. But in a way, isn't that interesting? That food would have to be considered together with what kind of medicine you're taking? So where do you find these things? How about this? What is Recently, recently, the yellow in macaroni and cheese is now turmeric. No longer yellow food number 22 or anything else that would make your children run straight up the wall. <laughs> turmeric, Heinz mustard. Turmeric. Turmeric. Turmeric has become the yellow color to use. You'll find it in all sorts of food, generally considered safe, and of course ours. Um, Low toxicity. It is very difficult to eat enough of these things cause you a problem. Be careful if you're pregnant mums. Although lots of pregnant mums swear by these products to reduce nausea, and they're fine for that. Uh, it's when you start getting into the world of supplements that you have to be really worried because you now start to take very high doses. Um, just so that you know, 1,000 milligrams today is two capsules typically. That's about the amount that an Indian villager eats every day as part of their normal diet. 1,000 milligrams. Oh, that graph didn't come out so well, but can you see that one on the right-hand side, that top graph that kind of goes zip like that? You can't see it. Um, it starts here in 2004, 2015, 2016. These are the number of searches on Google for the word turmeric. Um, but this one is the one that got me. That's kind of interesting for, for a company that makes turmeric. But between these two years, 2011 and 2015, there was a 900% increase in the searches for the term acid reflux on, on Google. Upset stomachs, 321%. These are the searches of a sick group of people with lifestyle diseases. Right, these are lifestyle diseases. This eating the wrong food, not getting any sleep, not drinking any water, being generally unhappy and stressed. And these are the tip of the iceberg issues why so many people are searching for turmeric. They're looking, we're looking for something. And what's interesting is that this isn't going away. In many ways, this is very positive. An awareness of the health impacts of what we eat combined with the amazing ability to find information on the internet, 
has created this wonderful ability to have meetings like this and to talk about simple things that we can do. And some of these aren't real sexy and some of them don't make a lot of money and so a lot of people don't talk about them. But you don't need big advertising to eat fresh fruit, sleep eight hours a night and drink a couple of glasses of water a day, right? This is absolutely necessary for our bodies to function. Um, ginger and turmeric, okay, let's switch gears. So we've talked about it is primarily a food. But so many people don't incorporate these foods into their diet or don't know how to or maybe have a need for higher levels than they will get just from food. So there's also supplements. Um, our supplements are really complicated. They're ginger and turmeric roots ground up and put in a capsule. <laughs> they have a really short ingredient list. Organic ginger, organic turmeric, vegan capsule. They're just a convenient way to take them. Um, so why is there so much information about turmeric? I mean, why are you guys here? Uh, who, let's start, when did you first hear about turmeric? Let's start with 2005 or before. 2010 and before. In the last 12 months. Yeah, so many people. Uh, it's good news because this is a remarkably good product. Um, so why? Okay, here's what happened. In 2004, and at the end of this presentation, and I'm not sure how we make this presentation available, but if people would like it, it'll be on our website, I'm sure, or we'll put it through Healthy Savannah. Um, and at the end of this presentation, there's a whole lot of references. Anything I use in here is a publicly available reference, so you can actually go see the original document if you choose to. Um, <coughs> There was, there was a study that came out that said in India, many people in India had colon erectile cancers at something like 40 times lower than the US. Like it was staggering. And then somebody else did a study that said, wow, a lot of people in India eat turmeric. And turmeric's high in this chemical called curcumin, which is the yellow color. And therefore, turmeric must cure cancer. All right? Now that's actually maybe true, maybe not. What I will tell you is also most people in India are vegetarians. So it could be lots of reasons why this is true. Whatever the reason, it sparked an enormous outpouring of research. And that's a good thing. So I don't care what caused it. The end result has been very, very positive. Um, another website interesting for you to look at, pubmed.gov, put out by the National Institutes of Health. If you're a geek like me and like reading research, this is the place to go. This lists by keyword search anything you want. If you want to look at diabetes and turmeric, do it. Just search for it. When I searched for turmeric last week, to, just to update these numbers, there are currently 4,100 active research papers looking into turmeric. There are 10,000 on curcumin. So these are well-respected researchers looking at everything from mouth ulcers to heart disease to brain cancer that are looking into these old remedies and overwhelmingly they are finding positive results. Um, and yet, when I read stuff like this, I get a little worried. Uh, a recent MD Anderson University of Texas review, this was one of these reviews where they go and review all of the documents. They came back with this list that I found troubling. So this says I just need to walk near a turmeric plant, <laughs> right? And I'm going to get this spring in my step and off I'm going to go. How on earth could these things seem to have a positive effect on all of this, and yet they do. So how is that? So a couple of, couple of technical kind of words here, but it appears at its heart, turmeric has a very positive effect on inflammation. 
and it appears that inflammation is possibly one of the two great things we have to deal with in our bodies. At the core of almost all disease is inflammation. And yet, without inflammation, we would die. You have to have inflammation. It is your body's method of healing itself. I hurt my ankle, my ankle swells up. Why? Because my body is sending messenger cells there. Those messenger cells are releasing heparin. That heparin is allowing blood to flow in with white blood cells so my body can heal my ankle. My, my ankle will heal over four or five days and it will get better. There is, and I didn't know any of this was going on. And this is true all over our bodies. Without inflammation, we could not survive. And yet when inflammation becomes chronic, Okay, when, when it won't go away, when we keep doing the thing which causes the inflammation, we end up with inflammatory diseases like Crohn's disease and autoimmune diseases and diabetes and coronary heart disease. These are the consequences of repetitive inflammation that never resolves itself. It turns out that particularly turmeric does not like a pharmaceutical eliminate inflammation, it takes the top off it. It allows our body to have some inflammation, but it modulates it. It reduces that inflammation. It stops that inflammation becoming a chronic problem. And it seems to do this right across our body system. And it's thought by the researchers that this is probably what's happening, is that because these chemicals in there reduce the overall limit level of inflammation in our bodies, it allows our bodies to naturally heal. It allows them to get back to their natural state of wellness. Does it mean you can have a party lifestyle, take a turmeric tablet in the morning? See, I thought this is the way statins worked. Anybody on statins? So I figured you could eat anything, right? Anything at all. Just pop a statin and that cholesterol just dropped down again the next morning. It was like this, no, it's not the way it works. It's not the way it works with turmeric. But eating turmeric affects a number of these really critical inflammatory pathways in a very positive way. It reduces inflammation in our liver and allows our liver to do what livers do, which is be a storehouse of energy and a method of removing toxins out of our body. These things allow our body, I believe, I am convinced, they allow our body to get back to a natural state of wellness. They are not magic, but for 7,000 years, people figured out that it works. It works. Ginger, I did an interview yesterday. Where's Lillian? Lillian, my, my movie star co-star over here. Um, on WTOC and we were talking about you know your grandmother telling you to eat to drink ginger ale if your stomach was upset Do you remember that yeah how much ginger is there in ginger ale <laughs> not a whole lot any depends what sort of ginger ale <laughs> I've been favoring this side of the room because I've been right-handed <laughs> Um, actually, in most modern ginger ales, there's almost none. But that one's artillery. That's got cayenne pepper as well as ginger. That one's Ogeechee Gold. It's got gal and gal turmeric and ginger. That one's ginger ale. And one of you better have a bottle opener because they don't twist off. Um, ginger ale always used to have ginger in it. Uh, most ginger ales don't now. These ginger ales do. And you can buy these ones at lots of... Uh, this is my ad lots of select retailers and also most of the Kroger stores in the, in the organic and natural area. That's ours. Yeah, uh, we, we do ginger beers as well. So what does ginger do? Um, you ever heard of this term free radicals? You hear this thing? Okay, what's a free radical? It's another one of these terms we all hear and I have no idea what it is. It's not good. <laughs> free radicals, when, when our body has stress, when our body is breaking down disease, when our body's exposed to sun and damaging radiation, 
it produces these things called free radicals. They're basically chemicals that float around in our bodies and they have a very nasty habit of interacting with our DNA and they can cause damage, okay? So we want to eat a diet rich in antioxidants, grapes, apples, green leafy vegetables, right? These are all things that are full of antioxidants and ginger is bursting with antioxidants. So ginger is extremely good at helping our body detox itself. It's also very delicious. Um, and for anybody who ever has suffered from motion sickness, it is a potent anti-nausea, potent anti-nausea. People on chemo, swear by it. Pregnant mums, swear by it. People that drive in cars and boats, ginger really, really works. Your grandmother was right. Um, they're complex blends though. Don't look at them as though they're just a pharmaceutical or single item. These are hundreds of different chemicals that work together. So wherever possible, try to eat products that are either the whole roots or things made from the whole roots and not, not extracts. A um, couple of things to be concerned about. They come into your body quickly, they go out of your body quickly, right? So this is not a little is good, so a lot must be great. Don't, don't think for a moment wow, if I'm going to eat turmeric, well, I might just eat a pound of it because I heard that it was good for you. It's probably not going to hurt you, but it's not going to do you any good. I mean, your, your body's only going to absorb a small amount of it. It's going to pass the rest out. You're better to have these things progressively during the day in different ways. Have some turmeric tea. It's delicious. You know, put some turmeric honey on some yogurt. Make a salad dressing out of it. Grate some turmeric up, right? Have some ginger with your meal. Have some ginger beer. Do, you know, th this is, or ginger ales. Eat these things progressively as part of your normal diet. That's the way your body wants to, to use them. Um, inflammation we've talked about. So maybe a couple of summary slides and we'll do some questions. So low toxicity. They've been used for thousands of years. Be careful if you are on prescription medications, if you have an you know, an immune problem if you're a pregnant mum. Do talk to a primary care physician before you start taking anything, not just these products. But they're food, they're food. Sometimes they come packed as medicine, it's just for simplicity of use. They are delicious. They are really delicious. Um, they're easy to incorporate. Turmeric, by the way, is not spicy, it's savory. It, it's, it's almost like a root vegetable flavor. So don't, don't be frightened of these things. You know, just use a little and incorporate it. Um, they're very broad in their effects and they're fairly quick. We completed a clinical trial here in Savannah over the last 12 months where people, this was through a uh, sports medicine place, a doctor prescribed these and they put them with or as a replacement for meloxicam, which is a prescription pharmaceutical for uh, people with uh, joint pain. And broadly, uh, turmeric and ginger work the same, but not in the same time. The meloxicam would make you feel better like in a day. The ginger and turmeric might take a couple of weeks. But at the end of the trial, most people on ginger and turmeric wanted to keep taking it. Nobody wanted to keep taking meloxicam. Um, available in a wide range of forms, crystallized gingers, ginger beers, supplements, infused honeys, powders, teas. I mean, we alone, we're not the only source of this stuff, but we have 40 different products. So there are lots of different ways to incorporate these into your daily diet and enjoy it while you do it. Thank you, I'll be very happy to take some questions.